welcome back to another episode of the nonprofit show everybody i'm julia patrick ceo of the american nonprofit academy i have a really interesting guest on today because rachel fiddler canella and i'm saying that correctly right you are okay rachel and i different generations but went to the same school situation in southern california so we were chit-chatting about you know, this amazing uh, environment that we are in and what a small world. And so I know you're going to be fabulous, Rachel, because you come oh. from the Claremont school system. <laughs> Thank you. I loved that connection. It was so great. <laughs> really funny. Really, really funny. Well, today we're going to be talking about grant prospecting and the playbook. What you mean? We just don't like send out grants and get all this money. Is that, <laughs> is that what you're going to tell us, Rachel? You know, some people like to think that. I'm sure many folks have boards and leadership that say, oh, just apply for this grant. It's easy, right? Um, but no, I'd say that there's maybe a little more thought that needs to go into to keep us all sane as we're doing our grant seeking. I love it. Well, you know, I appreciate you saying that because I, I, I love the word playbook. I mean, it is a manual and, and something that we put thought into. Mm -hmm. And so it really helps temper our expectations and I think, dare I say, our results yeah. and our impact. And so I love that we're going to have this conversation. Um, it's it's really an amazing thing because we have um, so many folks to thank. We have so many things to get going before we get started. I want to make sure that I give a shout out to your part-time controller, American Nonprofit Academy, Bloomerang Staffing Boutique, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are our good fits and that they really work with us to help us put on these, these episodes. Super, super powerful. So Rachel, before we get going, talk to us about Instrumental and what it all, what your software does and, and maybe even give us some background to your organization. Sure. Yeah. So um, I actually come from the nonprofit world. So when I started at Instrumental, I really was pretty blown away by what an incredible resource it is to nonprofiteers. Uh, essentially, Instrumental is an all-in-one grants platform management system. So you'll find that if you go into Instrumental, you can not only do your prospecting there and find access to, as of this morning, I think it was 19,000 426 or something like that. Don't quote me, but something like that. Um, RFPs, active RFPs for US-based 501c3s um, and nonprofits. Um, but you'll also be able to track those opportunities and track funders. So uh, it's a great way to keep everything organized. There's a whole tracking system with task management and calendar integrations, all those fun things that I know for some of our grant seekers who maybe are one person shows in their organization, they're doing fundraising and, you know, programmatic support um, and grant seeking, having something where everything's all consolidated together um, is really valuable. And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, the, the company was founded by folks who come from the grant seeking and grant making sectors. So they really understood that uh, this was a need at the time. Mm -hmm. This was um, back in 2014. So we're hitting our 10 year mark. And uh, this has really been um, kind of a great year of growth for Instrumental where we're seeing a lot more uh, staff and strategy around how we're serving uh, the nonprofit sector. So I'm always intrigued with any, um, oh my gosh, any any in, uh, innovation, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the combination of digital engagement, thought, action, indeed, how we get our brains yeah. to flow with this and mm -hmm. to, to start excelling the way we work. Um, so I'm fascinated by this opportunity to be a, a, a one-stop organizing center. Mm -hmm. Is this something that somebody that doesn't, is not a professional grant writer can use, or is this, is this more significant and, and structured for those professional grant writers? Because it is a profession. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not something that you can just have volunteers do. I think a lot of organizations think, oh, she was a good writer. Put her in or, you know, she can work from home. Put her in. It's like, yeah, it doesn't work that way. Talk to us about that stratif stratification of our labor. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's a great point. And I think, again, goes back to this maybe potential misunderstanding of 
grant seeking as a process in your organization? I think it varies, obviously, depending on the org. But for some of us, and I'm sure some of us who are even listening in, they may have had uh, maybe even some more negative experiences with the grant seeking process in organizations that are a little more in that survival mode. They're chasing down that next grant. They don't necessarily have a dedicated grant seeker in their organization. It can lead to a little bit of a lack of strategy or intentionality around certain funding opportunities, which is why we are talking about the prospecting playbook today, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think instrumental is beneficial uh, to folks that are intentionally seeking grants. So that can be mm -hmm. a grant writer in the organization, could be a director of advancement or uh, planned giving. Um, you know, it could uh, be a variety of roles. And the cool thing about the platform is it also is intentionally collaborative. So you could even have a board member or your CEO or executive director in the platform looking at the visibility of grants in the pipeline, grants that have been awarded, spend down on those grants. That's a new feature that we added this year. So you can actually see where programmatic spend is going and how much money is left on the award. All that stuff. Um, it is really user friendly and intended to be utilized by folks across the organization. Right. You know, there's such an art to management of grants. And mm -hmm. I think that this is one of the things that uh, we forget. You and I were briefly chatting in the green room on yeah. uh, the expectation of what a board thinks, even other people in the C suite, honestly. Sure. Um, yes. Just go out and get that money, and we've got it, and it's all good. But the actual aspect of the relationship and reporting back, can you talk to us about that and what you see and how that that tends to work within your platform? Yes, we do have a pretty robust reporting system. So one of the tools I mentioned was kind of these collaborative tools. You can assign tasks to folks in your organization and they can be notified that, you know, they're on first for a grant that's coming up. Perhaps you have an LOI, a letter of intent that you're intending to submit. Uh, you've got multiple people that kind of want to have visibility on that particular relationship building that's happening with the funder. So uh, you can use the documents library, the reporting tools and instrumental to print off kind of updates on tasks, updates on uh, status of grants, if you've heard back. Um, I think that's something that you know, inherently is challenging when you're working in things like Excel or mm -hmm. multiple email chains. Sometimes yeah. as well, you know, I remember in my nonprofit days, there was information that only lived in one person's head. And that's yeah. probably true for not just grants, but many other aspects of our work as well, right? Oh. Um, but I think where we see the difference in organizations that are really mm -hmm. making substantial change in their grant strategy is that folks are in the know. It's not all in one person's brain. There's somewhere where it's documented and said, hey, this funder has a great connection to one of our board members. And we're mm -hmm. spending intentional time cultivating that relationship that's been documented and instrumental. It's in our CRM and there's an integration mm -hmm. there so we can keep track of how that's mm -hmm. going. And the board, I think, can just feel more confident in where the organization is going uh, strategically with grants. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to me like this is a, a point of learning and education for, and again, I'm going to throw the C-suite in there too, because I think <laughs> a lot of people are like, you know, you grant writers, go out and get us money. And then they forget mm -hmm. this whole thing Yeah. Um, to, to bring to the forefront of what the process is. Um, what the win rate is, yes. how these things work. Do you have any concept about, or I should say information about how long the average grant price process takes, win rates, to help us understand what the reality of winning grants is in this U.S. country? Yeah, no, I think that's a really great question. The So we recently did a survey, it was with, you know, 100 plus grant writers. And they found that on average, I think it was maybe 75% or more. Uh, and I'll look back at these stats to make sure that this is this is right. But my, my recollection is 75% or more of grant writers were spending 10 hours or more on a single application. So, I mean, think wow. about how many you might be looking for, right? I, I was blown away by that statistic. And if we're going to spend 10 hours on one application, we'd better make sure it's worth our time, you know, and there's a lot of maybe indicators there that mm -hmm. an application will be worth that. I'm happy to talk a little bit more there, but that just goes to show that it, it does take time. It's not mm -hmm. an easy effort to just apply for that grant. Mm -hmm. You know, when you just said that, even if you're off by 20%, <laughs> it's an 
<laughs> right? I mean, this is like how my brain works. Yeah. Even if you're off by 20%, going the other way, and it's it's eight hours, and you save yourself two hours. Yeah. That's a whole day. Yes. Without interruption, without doing anything else. And we all know that's not how our, our work functions. 100%. So you're easily into this for two days and still just trying to answer email and keep your head above right. water, right? Yeah. Wow. And, I mean, some organizations, you know, they're applying to 25, 30, 50 yeah. grants a month. So just thinking about the time investment there. And I know some folks too have some great strategies in place to simplify that process. Mm -hmm. They've sure. got their boilerplate templates. They've sure. got their language ready to go. Um, and they maybe have some tools that help them with that, right? But if on average folks are spending that much time, just, you know, thinking about balancing that with everything else is, is kind of mind blowing. It is. And I think it's a great thing to know for your playbook, right? Yes. So that you can allocate um, what you're going to be doing, but also so that your team understands what you're going to actually be able to achieve, like how you're going to be able to put out. I mean, I think this is a fascinating conversation. I've never had anyone um, give us that information or or even that framework for what the the, the investment is on mm -hmm. on the nonprofit side right because there's yeah. an investment in that um talk to us about what you know to be win rates and mm -hmm. the timing and and how this kind of flows um i would imagine in the course of of doing the nonprofit show for five years now and 1100 episodes. And, and we've had a lot of folks on to talk about grant administration, grant writing, the concept of grants, grant management. Um, there seems to be like a wide swath of who's successful and who's not. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that once you've figured out the secret sauce, and I think that's process, <laughs> you tend to win more grants. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Is it like a self-fulfilled prophecy? <laughs> you know, this is another great question and something that it does make me think of a case study we recently did with a customer of ours. I'll have to look back and look at the particular kind of parameters there. But one thing they had experienced is essentially they were, they used to, pre-using Instrumental, they were applying to um, a certain number of grants. I can't remember the specific number off the top of my head, but they were spending a significant amount of time applying for grants and their win rates were lower. What they mm -hmm. found is that the more time they spent actually evaluating grants before applying, they could spend less time writing them. So they submitted less grants, mm -hmm. but they had higher win rates. And that goes back to process, like you just said. They yeah. had a, a set process, a set mm -hmm. um, established evaluation method. And that took a little bit of time too. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I do go back to saying, you know, mm -hmm. in order to save time, you do have to make time first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I think, you know, given my experience working with folks in the sector, it's worth mm -hmm. the effort. And they do see that, you know, that's an anecdotal um, experience I'm bringing up. But mm -hmm. I think in general, folks that have the processes set up, they have the strategy in place, do tend to see higher win rates because mm -hmm. they're spending their time more effectively. Right. Well, I would say that's common sense. I mean, if you... For sure. I was just uh, doing a board retreat last night, a board kickoff for a, a national board. And you know, we, we were talking about if you're trying to build your board and just anyone who can fog a mirror and somebody who seems like a nice guy, ultimately, you are not helping the organization. If you mm -hmm. step back, mm -hmm. do interviewing, really be thoughtful about who you're bringing on, what's their skill set, yep. you know, how are they going to engage, you're going to get a, a stronger board member. That position might be empty for a little bit longer than you're comfortable with. Sure. So I can see, you know, it's it's an approach um, and it's it's also, if you will, a management philosophy, I would say, too. Let's talk about this, the fit, the, mm -hmm. the grant fit. And, you know, because we've been talking about evaluation, I feel like the number the the value of a grant is like this sexy, shiny object that everybody goes after. Right. Without thinking how am I going to respond? How am I going to, you know, achieve the impacts that are desired? How am I going to build the relationship? It's just about that number flashing out. Yep. What do you think? What do you see? 
You know, I think that's easy to do sometimes, especially in those organizations, like I mentioned earlier, that are in that a little bit of survival mode. They're trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to get that next great chunk of funding for a program that is literally happening tomorrow, right? And many of these nonprofits are serving audiences that need support day in and day out. So they're trying mm -hmm. to get into a grant seeking cycle. Uh, they might be kind of chasing the money, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, where we start to kind of take a step back and invite folks to think more strategically is that great, that funding might be a, a lovely, you know, a sum that would supplement what you're doing really well. However, mm -hmm. there are so many other indicators that you want to work on and focus in on before you even think about you know, starting the application, writing your organization's name in that first field. Um, things like, does the grant maker's mission match your organization's mission? Right. Do they have any key stats on giving patterns? Can you look back in Form 990s and see, oh, there's past grantees that look very similar to my organization. They have missions that are similar to ours. They funded similar uh, project areas of focus, things like capacity building or general operating, if that's what you're going for. Um, things like geographic area focused, are they giving yeah. in your region? And if not, that might be an indicator that you're not going to be the best fit for them. Um, and probably, okay, the most important one, the one I'm going to emphasize again and again, are you actually eligible for the grant? I think it's <laughs> it's wild to me how many folks get all the way through an application and they read and they're like, gosh, actually, I don't think we're eligible for this. First yeah. thing on the list. First thing. I love that you said that because, <laughs> you know, I, I, I really appreciate that you said that because I think that there's this sense that... And a funding organization has all this money and they don't really have parameters. They have paperwork and you have to check off the box, right? That you have right. to do certain things, but that it's a lot more discretionary than it really is. Mm -hmm. And I yes, think that's absolutely. something that we really miss. I think we miss that these funders have their own mission, vision, and values. Right? Yes. That's something I was just going to bring up as well. I mean, they're looking for organizations that support their initiatives, their mission, right? So you want to show how are you supporting this foundation's work, essentially, and where are the kind of uh, matchmaking elements that you're like, great, I am the perfect fit for you. You know, I like to call it our our funder matchmaking. Um, can I, how can you you prove to your your funders and your relationship building there that you are a good fit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing. Um, and I want to jump into this piece of it. And that is the relationship aspect. Yeah. Because that's one of the things that I feel like the digital nature of our world, and especially in the nonprofit sector, where we're like, oh my God, we can communicate with our donors, or we can communicate with our stakeholders through a digital process, we're, we're building a, a digital relationship mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily that old school relationship where the program officers would be, you know, of the funding agency would be touring the campus or, or meeting right. and, and all of this stuff. Can you talk about what you all are seeing at Instrumental and, and what that looks like? Because this is a changing time on how human communication is even managed let Absolutely. alone, you know, let alone the process of, of this. So what are you seeing? Yeah, you know, I think that you're right. It is changing. And the field at large, grant seeking in general, has changed so much with the new tools. And I know I've talked to uh, grant seekers who have spent time, you know, in pulling out uh, foundation directories from the library and like physically mm -hmm. going through opportunities. Right. Those times are long gone, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, we do have a lot of ways that we can connect with funders. I think mm -hmm. some of the more creative and unique aspects that I've seen from folks more recently, I know this probably sounds obvious, but um, making sure your organization's presence on social media or your website, even if you're not you know, mm -hmm. very active on TikTok or uh, mm -hmm. Instagram or something like that, is uh, it, it really shows off and kind of you know makes your organization um, look good. It, sometimes yeah. we forget that our website is the first thing that a funder might look at when they're looking yeah. to see a little more about our organization. So, yeah, you know, holding ourselves accountable there, making sure that we have updated stats, showing that we're actively serving the community. Mm -hmm. It's happening every day, and it can sometimes be one of those things that gets put on the back burner. Um, right. So, our visibility in this space, I think, is really important. 
Otherwise, I'd say, you know, using our networking connections, things like LinkedIn, um, you know, make, using those Form 990s or an instrumental, you can see key people like the board of trustees or the president of the foundation and seeing if you have any third degree connections. You just never know, um, mm -hmm. you know, when you do a quick LinkedIn search, maybe your board member has a random connection to someone that happens mm -hmm. to be related to a foundation you're pursuing. Yeah. I agree with you on that. And I would say over the trajectory of my career, I, I can remember um, sitting in a board member, uh, sitting in a board meeting and the development director came in and was chatting and, and, and the CEO would bring in different folks, different leaders, mm -hmm. to just give like us an update about what they did. And so this development director wasn't at all, every meeting it was kind of like maybe, you know, once a year or twice a year. Sure. And I remember the development director was giving an update on what grants they were pursuing. And just, you know, it was like reading off a list. <laughs> and one of the fellow board members was like, oh, my God, the CEO is my neighbor. I just saw, <laughs> I just saw him this morning when we were taking out our trash. To oh, the I love it. And, and it was like such a lesson, Rachel. Yeah. Because... I'm sure that neighbor, I mean, in the relationship that they had, didn't know that this, that na their neighbor was on our board. Of course. And, and you never know how the intersection of relationships can work. Right. But if we're not sharing that, then it it's never explored, right? You 100%. Know, right? Oh, I love that story. It's a great reminder. And yeah, who knows if no. that advancement director hadn't just said the name, right, in that meeting. That's why visibility and that strategy across teams is so, so valuable. Yeah, yeah. It's really, really important. And I think it can be easier. Uh, it, it becomes a habit, maybe. 100%. You know, a habit. So you talked about LinkedIn. You talked about the ability for us to integrate our marketing and communications, mm -hmm. our branding, so that we're all rowing in the same direction, which we need to be doing anyway, whether we're, you know, and for a lot of other reasons. But what are some of these uh, other tools that you see coming forward? I've got to believe that AI is one of those, <laughs> those big presents. Yes. And that's a buzzy word, of course. I'm yeah. sure many folks have talked about the implications of AI in their specific niche within nonprofits, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but yes, I, I would add that um, using tools like AI has definitely been something we've seen uh, more use of. We actually do have a tool that um, just came out of beta for Instrumental that is uh, a grant writing AI. It's pretty amazing. I was really excited by it. And it goes back to this point of trying to essentially save ourselves time, um, be more efficient in our grant seeking. This mm -hmm. tool will essentially capture your information that you've put in. So it's your it's your words. It's your you're still keeping the human element of the work that we do in grant seeking. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, basically making suggestions based on previous applications you've written. So I think about, you know, you're writing all these applications. You spent 10 hours on a gorgeous, wonderful application. It's so pithy. It's got these great sentences in there. And then you have to do it again tomorrow because you have another yeah. grant to apply for, right? Wouldn't it be great if you could take the words and the sentences that you've crafted and reformat them just slightly so that they match more closely to the mm -hmm. next application you're working on? And that's essentially that tool. So I do see folks utilizing those more. I think, you know, again, there's always going to be that element, um, the human element, which is that yeah. you're still going to have to go in, do your edits, think about how you might be playing up the knowledge that you have about the funder, uh, just additional you know, supports that you want to give these AI mm -hmm. tools, but they are saving people a ton of time. I think one person said it cut about 40% of their time that they were working on grant applications, which is a pretty great stat. Well, it's huge. And, and just think about if you took that amount of time and energy and the reduction of stress and exhaustion, and you could apply that to even, you know, 30% more applications, <laughs> right? Yep. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, if mm -hmm. you could if you could increase your ability to get your name and, and brand out there, I think that's it's it's remarkable. Well, yeah. you've been lovely to chat with today. I was thinking as I was preparing for this, um, I've just got to share this in the world of, of grant seeking. Um, a young woman that worked for a uh, board that I served on, mm -hmm. uh, which was the nation's largest domestic violence shelter, a young woman by the name of Katie Hobbs, 
grew up to be the governor of our state mm -hmm. of Arizona. She was a grant writer. She was a woman who uh, was a social worker. She, I could identify that funding wasn't happening. It wasn't going where she needed it. And so she raised her hand and said, I will start writing grants. Wow. She figured it out. She became really great. Ultimately, she was brought in as a grant writer. I mean, really moved away from, you know, her education to become a professional grant writer because she had unlocked the process, right? Yeah. And now she's governor of our state. And so I always Incredible. think grant writers, they rock. <laughs> they can do anything, right? <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. They are the backbone of, of so many of these organizations as well. And I know for from speaking with many grant writers and, you know, advancement directors and folks, um, it can feel like a little bit of maybe even an isolating field sometimes. Yes. You're working solo, you're, you know, chipping away at these applications, you're not necessarily seeing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, feedback from funders, it can feel a little a little isolating. So I love supporting our grant seeking community. And um, I do also truly believe they are rock stars. They are. And they, you know, when when there are uh, levels of education, there's technology, there's mm -hmm. thought leadership, um, there are things that they can put in their playbook. Um, everybody wins. Yeah, everybody wins. And, you know, a funder wants to be successful, too. Yeah. You know, a funder wants to invest in something that is going to make them look good and exactly. will help them with their achievement of their mission, vision and values. So it goes both ways. Right. It's not just about, you know, getting those funds out there. It's about building impact. So I love yep. the, the nexus between what you all are doing and uh, what we need in our sector. It's just been a delight to have you on, Rachel Fiddler Canella with Instrumental. Um, I feel like you and I have this like weird bond going through <laughs> life. With our I agree, Julia. Yeah. So weird. So weird. But um, it's been really fun to have you on and to learn about instrumental. Again, I want to say thank you to all of our instrumental, as I would like to say, partners. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, and 180 Management. Um, these are the folks that really help us day in and day out so that we can have these amazing conversations. Rachel, I expect to get you back on the nonprofit show. This has really been fun. Um, we talk a lot about this ecosystem of grant writing, grant seeking, mm -hmm. grant challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, this is a conversation we've never had with this digital component. And mm -hmm. so it's been a lot of fun and I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we sign off each and every episode of The Nonprofit Show with this message. It's pretty simple, but it's pretty complicated. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everybody.